So it's a little after three, and we're, we're, our numbers as usual continue to raise, but I wanted to go ahead and get started because I've got some housekeeping things to cover, and I want to give Clemson as much time as possible for his presentation. So welcome to the Greensboro Chamber of Commerce Daily Action Call. I'm Lou Ann Flanders Steck, the EDV, EVP of Entrepreneurship with Launch Greensboro at the Chamber. And as you've noticed this week, we've shifted our scheduling. So after Motivation Monday, try this Tuesday and work from home Wednesday, welcome to our first Think Ahead Thursday. For today's call in particular, there's a few things to think about. Clemson does have a presentation, so, and a few ways that you can interact. So if you are calling in, rather than using Zoom's option to view and see the video, you may fiss, miss a few things, but you still will be able to take away some great content, so no worries. If you have a question, please use the chat function. We'll be monitoring it throughout and do our best to get those answered. And as always, this call is being recorded and will be archived with all of our previous calls, which can be found on the Chamber website at greensboro.org slash COVID-19. So on our first Think Ahead Thursday, covering things we should think about as we begin returning to work in person and having those in-person gatherings that we can't wait to do again. We're gonna start with some tips from an expert in leadership and specifically experts uh, leadership in the time of crisis. So we're excited to have Clemson Terragano from CCL with us today. Clemson leads a global team responsible for the development, design, integration, and delivery of their leadership program and experience portfolio. His bio is much longer, but I've shortened it a little bit. So his, he's worked with clients in telecom, banking, and manufacturing industries, as well as all levels of government and universities. Prior to joining CCL, Clemson served over 24 years in the US Army. Thank you, Clemson, for that service serving in capacities from infantry soldier to West Point professor to Army Battalion commander. He's had, Clemson has an undergraduate degree from the Citadel. He earned an MA in political science, MPA and doctorate from Syracuse University. And he also earned an MA in security and strategy from the US War College. So he's an expert in leadership and many other things, obviously. So I've seen a portion of this presentation and I know you all will get some great insights out of it. So I'm gonna let him get going now. So welcome Clemson and thank you again for taking time to be with us today. Clemson, unmute yourself. That always helps. I was in, crisis. I was in crisis for a moment. <laughs> Thank you very much, Luann. I certainly appreciate it. It's an honor to be here on the first Think Ahead Thursday. And today, uh, I really want to thank Luann, Megan, David, Holly, and Action Greensboro for inviting me for this tremendous opportunity. Because if there's ever a time when we need to think about leadership through crisis, not just crisis leadership, but leadership through crisis, now is the time. And the development team for this research includes experts from the military, psychology, human resources, consulting, academia, and the person who is primarily responsible for the research that we're going to discuss today is Dr. Kevin O'Gorman from our San Diego campus. So a couple of things. When we looked at this, we realized that uh, COVID-19 is a recent crisis, but it's not the only crisis, it's not the only type of crisis but it's put people like you and me into facing some really tough decisions. And the question I'm gonna ask you today is how are you making those decisions? What we have found during the current coronavirus outbreak is that the way in which you, your team, and your organization show up in the midst of crisis matters. And it sets a standard for the future. Today, we'll talk about different ways to assess and make meaning of an ambiguous and changing landscape integrate new information to make strategic decisions with the goal of, 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 of igniting commitment, of not just having people fall into a fetal curl because things went wrong, but doing something that we often take, a grant, take for granted sometimes. We have at CCL right now a motto, and it is, don't waste a good crisis. So how can you ignite commitment 
from every member of your organization during this very difficult time. In our agenda, we're gonna talk about the overview of crisis stages, how we've identified a seven-step framework to move through those, and we're gonna offer some uh, resilience tips uh, at the end. The, and of course, we'll have a Q&A session as well. I am going to move through this fairly rapidly, so uh, be ready. Also be ready on your keyboards because we'll be putting some answers into chat as we go through as well. So CCL has been conducting research to help clients and leaders through crisis for about the last 30 years. We worked on the Challenger disaster and uh, we worked on uh, lessons learned from 911, deriving lessons from Hurricane Katrina, and now we're looking at COVID-19 because we wanna look at how to lead through crisis, not at crisis. I'm a qualified disaster responder on a number, uh, on, on a number of levels with a number of certifications. And in each one of the trainings I've received, I've learned how to react to a fire, how to react to an earthquake, how to react to, but it never talked to me about what do I lead through this crisis? What is my mindset when I do this? And that's what CCL wanted to focus on. So we're gonna start with the three stages that we've identified in every crisis. Assess, act, and evolve. The assess stage is often underutilized and may seem counterintuitive because we're going to think before we act. When there's a crisis, we generally run for the hot spot, the greatest need, and we don't take enough time because sometimes we don't believe there is enough time to orient ourselves to what will help us get through the crisis. But, you know, crises uh, unfold with different cadences. For example, you have the jarring shock of 911 versus the creeping realization, or some people refer to the tsunami, of COVID-19. In both cases, our values and the way we make sense of what is going on matters deeply to our response. We actually tend to start with the ACT stage. We prioritize the most urgent before we have perhaps fully scoped the picture. And if we start here so reactively, we tend to see burnout, confusion, and leaders being quickly overwhelmed. In any case, this stage leads us into sorting out the urgent from the important. And we're gonna talk a lot about this over the next few minutes, the urgent from the important, and then executing accordingly. And finally, in the evolve stage, we reassess our approach and often go back to new urgencies. So when we do this right, we've assessed the situation, we've acted to correct it, and then we've learned from that and we've evolved into the new reality. As the crisis ebbs, we take what we've learned, anticipate, and pivot to the future. So just from what I've said right there, take a moment and ask yourself, where are you right now? Are you in an assess stage, an act stage, or are you starting your pivot into what might happen after COVID-19? And put your answers into chat. I'm really curious to see where everybody is today. As those answers go into chat, we might want to think about as we assess, we are thinking about where we are. There we go. As acting, hey, we had to make some decisions and we're moving out and evolving. We're, we acted, but you know, we started to take a look at what we did and we're starting that pivot. If you're in a service industry, some people got to evolve very quickly because they're evolving into totally new ideas. So we've got a couple of acts, some evolve. And we'll find that because of where we are in this crisis, we're going to find that most of our folks on the call today are somewhere between act and evolve. So we're gonna talk about the steps that we can use to move through these different stages. And we've identified seven key steps. It's one thing to know where you are in the stage, but it's another thing to start taking the steps to impact the reality of that stage. So Clemson, can I inter interrupt you real quick? Yes, you this can. is a great question. Yes. So Lindsay, Lindsay asks, is it possible, be, possible to be <laughs> in all three? Oh, that's a great question. Um, yeah. You know what, we are always in all three if we're doing this right. Because you're gonna have one that's dominant, but you're probably in all three all the time. Because even if you're in Evolve and you're pivoting, you're starting to assess again. If you're in Act, 
you're starting to look at when do we need to pivot? Have I assessed this properly? If I'm an assess, I'm starting to look at when do I begin to act and was my last pivot right? So you're actually in all three at one time. What we've done in this is just took a slice in time and made it easy for us to understand this concept. But know that you are most likely evaluating all three, but there's one dominant one where you are. And we're going to talk about that when we talk about these seven steps. And that'll help clarify a little bit more about where you might find yourself. But Lindsay, thanks a lot for that question. Please keep them coming. So let's talk about these seven steps. The first part in assess has two key steps, orient and sense making. In step one, orient, we focus on individual and organizational resiliency. Doesn't that sound counterintuitive? You start by taking stock of your values that give you guidance and stability. Who are we, where do we want it, who are we and what makes us us? You consider how you wanna show up and reflect on how you have responded to stress in the past so you can mitigate your negatives and recharge yourself. The same goes for your organization. You ground people in the values, vision, and mission of the company. You might've heard this over and over again, even some television commercials. We are this company, we represent this, you will see this from us. That is actually a form of orientation. In step two, sense-making, we determine the nature and scope of the crisis and create a forum for leadership and action. Now you need to think about who gets invited into responding to the crisis and if all voices will be heard equally. In a crisis, you will need new, multiple, and diverse perspectives to make sense of the crisis. The leader's job, your job, is to make sure people work together to create shared direction, alignment, and commitment. And we're gonna talk about that when we talk about crisis leadership. Within the ACT stage, we have three steps. Triage, strategize, and execute. Triage is when you identify and address the most urgent priorities to act upon, which are the existential threats. What's most important? Remember, important and urgent. This is about committing resources and setting up your organization to treat the most vulnerable and wounded during the crisis. And those can be physical wounds or in many of our organizations, they're wounds we might not see, and they're wounds we have to pay very close attention to. It's also about how you show and lead with compassion, authenticity, clarity, and resolve in the heat of the crisis. And while triage is being assessed and addressed, running the business and incorporating dynamic changes in an emergent situation is part of leading through crisis. That leads to step four, strategize. You acknowledge that the ways you run your business and deliver value may no longer apply. It is not the AC, excuse me, it's not the BC world before coronavirus. We're now in the DC world during coronavirus, and we're looking at the AC world after coronavirus. So continuing in the act stage, step five is execution. Crisis leadership, which is about leading people and crisis management, which is about managing the machine. They need to be addressed together and not fight each other. In execution, you must both lead and manage. In the evolve stage, there are two steps, recalibration and pivoting. In step six, recalibrate, you reflect on what happened during the assess and act stages. This is where you might be in all three. This involves reassessing assumptions, reorganizing people, and redeploying resources. Successful leaders work with all stakeholders to create new plans and adjust existing ones to address the changing nature of the crisis. And this is where the process is iterative. We are in all three. You may go back through steps one through five multiple times, particularly if the crisis reemerges or comes in waves. Something to think about if we have a phase two of coronavirus after we open up the economy. So here's a quick poll for you, if you would, please. If you would, um, let me go over step seven, pivot, and then we'll do the poll, because I forgot to mention that one. You focus on future opportunities, business model changes, rebranding, and that's where you start looking towards the future. That's the uh, AC world after coronavirus. What are we going to be, and how are we going to act different to be more effective? 
To pivot successfully, you also assess the personal and organizational agility and resilience needed to prosper in the new changed world. So if my good friends could put up the poll, we're gonna ask you what stage do you think you're in right now? And if you think you're in more than one, hey, go ahead and mark more than one. A couple of people are recalibrating, that's excellent. Executing, sense making, Yep, this is, it's interesting because we've been in this uh, crisis for almost, some people will say five to six weeks where it really hit the United States. Um, we're a lot in, uh, in sense-making, strategizing, executing. It's interesting when I talked to our colleagues in Shanghai, I was on the phone with our office there last night, one of my team members who works in Shanghai, and she was telling me that um, although they thought they would be an executor recalibrate, um, they are still in sense making for the second stage. So they've actually started a second cycle of these seven steps. Yeah, a lot of people are in recalibration. Perfect. We're going to talk a lot about that. And we're going to spend some time on strategize as well. That's really, really helpful. Um, and I think with the number of answers we have in strategize, execute, and recalibrate, uh, we'll see that we are moving to a maturity of this crisis. Can you share the poll results? I want to make sure everybody can see the poll. Clemson, can you see them? Can everyone I can, see the absolutely. All right, thank you, Hannah, appreciate that. I'm glad you can see the poll. So we're going to keep moving and we're going to talk a little bit about sense-making. Because when we talk about sense-making, it's really what's going on. And the first part of sense-making is it would be interesting if you took this poll back to your team, back where you work, and find out where they think you are. Because one of the things that all of our leadership uh, surveys tell us is that one of the reasons leaders are effective is they are thinking in front of the people they lead. So you might be in triage, but your team might still be in sense making. So we wanna be aware of that gap and be able to talk with them about moving into the next phase. So I'm going to do this and continue moving. There we go. So let's go deeper into each step. And that's what we're gonna do next. And the first thing we're going to do is orient. In step one, orient, we start by taking stock of our organizational and individual values to give us guidance and stability. Leaders need to orient around both individual and organizational agility and resiliency. And it's interesting when we talk about agility because as I was looking at this, it reminded me of my favorite activity is I'm a, uh, I, I, I love to surf and I, I don't surf uh, much anymore. I'm a paddle boarder now, but I realized that agility is a lot like surfing and the crisis is the wave. And as that wave comes up, I've got to adapt as that wave shifts. I got to bring a creative approach to meeting that wave just at the right place so I can catch that wave the right way. And it doesn't toss me off the board and, you know, bring me under the undertow and make me toss into the sand. I've got to learn quick about how quick that wave's moving and I've got to be able to catch it in a way that most benefits the board. I got to communicate that learning and in a crisis you make that daily or as appropriate. But then I've got to learn, I got to be agile. I got to know when to cut right or cut left or even jump off the board if the wave's not going to follow through. That's what agility means. It's understanding that I don't control the wave, but I do get to control my board and I get to control my actions around it. So understanding that wave, understanding the crisis is so important. And that's why taking the time for orientation is critical. Resiliency, and we use Zoli's definition, is the capacity of a system, enterprise, or individual to maintain core purpose and integrity in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. 
And we're gonna take a deeper dive into resilience and provide some tips for lowering stress and reactivity while increasing individual and organizational resilience at the end of our webinar today. But when we start from orientation, what we wanna do is start from our core. And that means you are controlling the board, the crisis is not controlling you. Reorient yourself to your organization and your personal values, vision, and mission. And you need to demonstrate those values starting at the top. They need to be communicated often, more often than you think is needed, and they need to be operationalized. You need to set direction, alignment, and commitment, creating a space in which people in the organization can make decisions. And then you need to know the level of trust in your culture. You need to know the character of trust, who can do the work, and who is most loyal both to each other and to the organization. When you're orienting, there we go, what we wanna do is something that's very unique and we call it meeting complexity with complexity. You know, in a simple world, you know, uh, we don't need a very complex mindset. A very simple mindset and straightforward solutions will do. It's an everyday working world. We know it, we, it has some predictability and we can get through it. Now, when you have a simple mindset and an increasingly complex environment, you perceive complexity as chaos, even though there are patterns you can comprehend depending on your mindset. In a highly complex environment, individual intelligence, no matter the expertise, is insufficient. It requires collective intelligence, leading the interchange of shared mindsets and diverse perspectives. In collective intelligence, neither leaders nor experts, sorry, are the smartest one in the room. And I love what Kevin says here. He's a good friend and Kevin goes, Clemson, the smartest one in the room is the room. This means you have to move away from the reflex to circle the wagons tightly and you've got to include the diversity of intelligence that will meet complexity with complexity. And what that means is you've got to get the right people in the room and listen. You have to have collective sense-making with all the adults in the room. The smartest one in the room is the room. You need to flatten your culture as much as possible to get the right and best answers into the conversation. That includes making the dialogue transparent, and sharing as much information as you possibly can. And through it all, most important, listening and asking for continuous feedback. In that way, you meet complexity with complexity. The other thing is that crisis is an opportunity for both the organization and its clients. At the Center for Creative Leadership, we believe that leadership is a social process that enables individuals to work together to achieve results they never could achieve working alone. So you can tell if leadership is happening while the crisis is going on by looking at three outcomes. First in direction, which means agreement on goals. Do we all agree on where we're going and how to get there? Alignment, which is coordination of shared work. Do we know how we want to get there and what we are doing? And then commitment, which involves group trust, motivation, and responsibility. And it's not just commitment to the organization, it's commitment to every other person within that organization. So in the chat, if you would, thinking about DAC, uh, just throw in chat, uh, which one do you do best personally? Are you a really good person at providing direction and getting people on board? Are you a really good person at providing alignment and getting groups together to accomplish difficult tasks? Or are you really good at commitment and helping people work closer together and form strong teams? Go ahead and throw your ideas into chat. Because if you look at our uh, webpage, ccl.org, uh, at the end of next week, our CCL colleagues, Dr. Cindy McCauley and Dr. Chuck Paulus, are about to publish a paper that explores what DAC looks like in a crisis. So you want to keep an eye out for that. So we got Oh, this, this would be a good team. We got one person who's really good at direction, one at alignment, one at commitment. That'd be excellent. Thanks, Nikita. Just taking a quick sip here. Because you need to have all three. 
Direction gets people moving. Alignment keeps the organization moving. And commitment provides the energy to sustain that effort. So some quick takeaways just from orientation is first, you want to use your personal values. You want to increase the intelligence of your crisis approach by meeting complexity with complexity. You want to be aware of your and other stress-induced reactive mindsets, assumptions, and biases. And you want to build in time for resilience behaviors that work for you and demand others to do the same. And we also say, first, in a crisis, especially in a crisis, to keep communication going, always assume positive intent, that somebody is trying to help, and that if we can accept that they're trying to help, we'll probably be more open for their ideas. So the second part of assess is sense making. And the first thing in sense making is finding out, well, just what crisis are we in? And Jean Klon, Dr. Jean Klon uh, wrote a book that you can download off of ccl.org for free called Crisis Leadership. And in that, he talks about the three different types of crises. Level one crises are known problems and known solutions. It might be an unethical behavior by a senior leader that damages the company's reputation and brand. Level two are known problems, but unknown solutions. It might include a personal injury, you know, a property loss or serious damage to a company's reputation. A level three crisis, yeah, that's, that's COVID-19. It might include lives lost, businesses disrupted, events like the pandemic, but these complex problems come with unknown solutions. That's why that meeting complexity with complexity and getting the right people in the room and listening is so important because there's no playbook on how to respond. Leaders, we have got to continuously examine our assumptions and make sense of what actions to take. And this is how you do that, is you have to have a collective sense-making framework. And now that you've got a robust resource of people for sense making, you have to lead them through a collective conversation. So together you want to prioritize from the urgent now to the important soon. And the most urgent now is right there. And that's triage. Triage is a medical term and it means to sort. Doctors and first responders are trained to quickly identify who is in dire need of medical attention so they can attend to those most in danger. The same logic applies to crisis. In a response, you should, at a minimum, two track your response to deal with the most vulnerable and injured people and identify the urgent over the important. The triage team must respond quickly and fully resourced to be effective. As they respond, Another team, so we're talking about two teams. One is teams is a triage team, and the second team is what we call the concurrent team. This other team can take up important, important and emergent strategic, operational, stakeholder, and talent issues. So right now at the center, I'm part of a team that is building a uh, online portfolio. We're definitely the triage team. We want to get things like this and information out as quickly as possible to our community and our clients. Meanwhile, there's another team that's working parallel to us with a lot of intersection. And what they are working on are, uh, they are working on the concurrent focus of what are we going to do next? So when we talk about these four other quadrants, we have daily operations, which is what we do every day, day-to-day -day concerns and activities and focus on time, quality, and budget. By deliberate, we mean the pre-crisis business strategy upon which the continued success of the business is based. And by emergent, which is my favorite, we mean the new opportunities as well as the shift in focus and priorities needed to cope with the crisis. So just looking at these four quadrants, where are you right now? Which quadrant might you, you be in? Are you still in triage and, and working through what's happening? Are you more in daily operations, deliberate strategy, or emergent strategy? Let's go ahead and throw your answers into, uh, into the chat. And we're going to talk about how all of these things work together. Deliberate, yeah. There's a lot of folks that are, are, are really focused on what we want to do is move through this. Emergent, yep, we're creating things as we go through. Absolutely. That's kind of the, the tough one because it's, it's a really ambiguous environment, but boy, is that an environment with a lot of potential.
And we're going to talk about this when we get to our next step, which is strategize. But before we get to strategize, let's talk a little bit more on how we might be able to make sense of a crisis, especially for ourselves and others. Because leaders can begin to frame the crisis by communicating through the use of metaphors. And this is important because ultimate, ultimately leadership is about the co-creation of new realities. I, I love Kevin's thing here. Ultimately, leadership is about the co-creation of new realities. Metaphors include an implied logic that it frames a situation, indicates what kinds of roles and relationships people should adopt, and defines what is valued and also what success looks like. They really, you know, metaphors really power the, the mental models of others. And I'm curious about what metaphors you might have heard used in uh, our current crisis. Uh, we've heard we're fighting a war against crisis. It'll be a long journey. I'd like you to take a moment to reflect on how you are framing the crisis for your organization, why you're framing it that way, and how it fits with your organization's values, brand, and strategy. And if you'd like to share and put in chat, you might want to put in there any metaphors your organization is using right now to uh, define the uh, corona, uh, excuse me, the coronavirus situation. So I'm going to move on to triage. Right after we take away, take time to size, scope, and frame, understand the relevance of collective sense making, but most important, understand the important and uses of communicating the meaning of the crisis through narrative. So thank you very much for your chat, and let's talk about triage. And this gets deeper into that red box. In this stage, where we agree on priorities and set up a virtual operations room, take on roles and agree on triage communications. In this step, we have to identify clearly who and what is most vulnerable and prioritize our response and resources accordingly. This is triage. It means to sort. What are we going to do first? How are we going to do it? And who's going to do it? Now, it's interesting because you want to use people first, but in that uh, polarity between management and leadership, you start with triage. And when we start thinking about those decisions that we have to make very quickly, we want to make those decisions with compassion, authenticity, clarity, and resolve. We want to understand what is going through the minds and hearts of others. We want to understand ourselves and be authentic in our decisions because that adds credibility to our decision making. We want to be clear in the decisions that we're making and include transparent communication about what we know, what we assume, what we hope, and what we don't yet know. If you're wondering about how to communicate in, in the crisis, if you can follow those four steps, you'll be okay. And then we want to execute with resolve. We want to make sure that people know that we are doing our best and we are moving forward to a new future. So as we look at triage, some of the takeaways are determine which priorities are urgent versus important. There's that urgent and important thing again. And then the triage activities and execution processes, principles and practices for setting up a virtual operations room, which is probably a hub, which is virtual, clarifying urgent decisions, establishing short-term priorities, and putting together that strategic communications plan, and then building that accountab accountability culture. So the, our final, or excuse me, our fourth step is strategize. And as we're strategizing, Remember that concurrent focus that we spoke about? That's where our focus is, is on strategy. So we've taken care of triage, we have a team doing that, and now we have a concurrent focus. And what we're doing in the concurrent focus first is re-examining assumptions about the value of your operations and strategy. Organizational agility and resilience require rethinking assumptions that underlie your strategy and business model in the short term. You want to create the highest value exchange possible in your markets. And that means talking through an impact map with your customers and markets, exploring how you can shift and meet their demands. Find out what's most valuable and then how can you deliver that regardless of conditions, regardless of the crisis. 
So you need to identify when to lead and when to manage. And we're going to talk about that next. We want to have that concurrent focus. This is the role of that team. So many of you are in the ex excuse me, are in the strategize step. What you want to focus on is, are you maintaining triage so you don't go back? And you want to assess where your midterm resources and plans are. Reprioritize your new and existing strategy and refocus on your key client engagements. Finally, never waste a good crisis. Treat crisis as an opportunity for organizations and for your clients. In step five, execute, this is where we both do crisis leadership and crisis management. Done right, managing the machine, the structure, operations, and processes of business and leading people creates a virtuous double helix or interconnecting circle where one side enables the other. For example, the way you set up information flow can cause people to work together or create silos. The degree to which you build trust in your culture may determine how well you reach across functions and work across silos. Both managing machine and leading people are vital. Sometimes, and crisis is often one of those times, we emphasize one at the expense of the other. I can't take care of people because I gotta manage my business. Or, oh, my people are overwhelming, I must pay attention to them, and the business starts to decline. We may even start managing people, essentially treating them like objects in a process, instead of engaging them as thinking adults. Alternatively, alternatively, we might focus on so much on people, we neglect to make the hard choices about the business. You know, one example of how leaders balance the machine and human side came in 9-11 when uh, Jimmy Dunn, he was a managing partner of uh, Sandler O'Neill, lost 40% of its personnel in the World Trade Center attack. Dunn said that the firm's survival became his personal mission because he wanted to deny the terrorists a victory. And so he visualized his mission looking at his two hands. In one hand, he held his business concern, and in the other, he was taking care of Sandler O'Neill's people and their families. And he said that the more he led on the people issues, personally attending funerals, continuing salaries and benefits and other efforts, the more the business issues took care of themselves. So when we talk about execution, you wanna execute with resolve, and you want to effectively balance crisis management and crisis leadership. That's what we talk about, balancing the savvy of navigating the polarity between leadership and management. So now we're in Evolve, and the sixth step is recalibrate. And when we recalibrate, it requires reassessing all the previous steps and updating your approach. It's not just reevaluating in the moment. It's getting out of the arena and up in the stands long enough to look at the entire crisis process. You look at it and you go, with step one, did you ground yourself and others for stability, guidance, agility, and resilience? Did you invite the right people to develop the complex map of the situation? Or were you surprised by some new aspects that came into play that you had not anticipated? And some other things you want to do when you recalibrate, reorganize, and redeploy is acknowledge wins. That will really sustain your effort. Share and codify lessons learned. Many people are unaware that after every exercise in the Army, we were required to do after-action reviews. Why? To do lessons learned, share, and codify what we had done. You want to reprioritize urgent issues. You want to find out what do we have on the near horizon, and then what are the new threats we hadn't anticipated. And this is a rolling horizon exercise, one that you do over and over again. You also begin the stage number four and five again, creating planned short-term and midterm. And if an end is in sight, you definitely want to identify and assess positioning and transitioning to emerging market opportunities and business models. So in recalibrate, some quick takeaways. Acknowledge the greatest challenges in leading through a crisis. What was the challenges you faced? How'd you get through them? Celebrate that victory and move forward. Determine the appropriateness of the people and the process-focused measures taken so far, and gain clarity on the most effective parts of your crisis response. Once we've done that and we understand where we are, we are ready to take our seventh and final step, which is to pivot. And when we pivot, 
we anticipate the new, condi uh, new conditions, the aftermath of the crisis. What's changed in politics, economics, and society, and business, and the market that affect your value as a company? What will require you to change your strategy, your business model, your culture, talent, and perhaps your organizational structure? There's a full assessment needed here, and this may include scenario planning and usually something deeper than a SWOT, though that's a pretty good start. And SWOT being strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And you know, it's kind of interesting because we actually go back to resiliency. And we sit there and say, where are we right now? Where are we going and what do we need to do? The goal in pivot is not only to take advantage of the new market and to execute the strategy that you built in step number three, four, and five, but the goal in this step is to create the resiliency and agility to pivot the company's entire machinery, operations, process, structure, people, talent, culture, to the future, no matter how different and dynamic. And we do this when we facilitate leadership strategy for organizations and assess organizational resilience in organizations around the world. And we realize that in crisis, leaders have to be mentally aware, socially connected, emotionally positive, and physically fueled. And as you pivot, you can build organizational agility from the lessons learned that you picked up in recalibration. You can create a culture of learning agility through strategic continuous improvement. You can view crisis as an opportunity, leveraging new opportunities in the market, people, opportunity, culture, talent, and then you can be forward-looking, anticipating long-term next phase issues. But you know, you can also build your individual agility. And I go back to my surfing metaphor. If you stay in the present, if you face your emotion, if you know your balance on the board, if you show respect and understand that that wave is very powerful and you're surfing that wave, then you have the reality to have a, you know, have a really good ride. You want to make connections with others around you and be positive. Uh, General Colin Powell had a list of his uh, leadership rules, and one of his favorite rules is enthusiasm is a leadership multiplier. Be positive, not Pollyannish, but you know, that's what reinforces the resolve to get you through a crisis. And stay cool. In research that we've done, when people have asked the two things that they respect in the leader, regardless of ethnicity, nationality, look, uh, geography, they want two things. One is a sense of humor. The second is someone who's calm, especially in a crisis. Think today and take the crisis one day at a time. Focus on the positive, get grounded, prioritize, and focus. So those are the seven steps and the three stages. We want to assess, act, and evolve by orienting, sense-making, conducting triage, strategizing, executing, recalibrating, and then pivoting to be better after the crisis than when we went in. So if you feel comfortable, if you'd like to put into chat, what is one thing you might do differently when leading through a crisis as you go back uh, to work after our short session today? And I'll Going to go ahead and leave it with there. Take some questions. I think Luann's going to facilitate for us. I'll get this back on. Here we go. Does anybody have a question? Clemson, that was amazing. So much information. I actually had one question. So, and it, it's kind of a, a esoteric question, maybe. How do values impact leadership in a crisis? Oh wow! What a I know great. it's kind of deep. Sorry. No, I love. I, no, actually, it's 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 really interesting. Um, and I've got two two thoughts on that. Someone, a, a leader's true values will come out in a crisis, because if someone is trying to cover up a value or or a lack of values, they might be able to do that in normal uh, in the normal world because they have time and they can predict things. In a crisis, when you can't be predict, when you have no predictability that veneer gets rapidly ripped away. And that's one of the reasons, the second part, that's one of the reasons that, believe it or not, many organizations spend a lot of time on character building of young leaders so that they build those strong values younger uh, as leaders so when crisis hits, when difficulty hits, those values come out strongest. And I've seen many times in many different crises where 
uh, very senior people in very senior positions became very ineffective and people in very junior positions basically rose up because they had the stronger character and they saved the day. We had, and uh, when I was uh, in Kosovo, uh, we had to, we had to deal with a number of civil disturbances and we had a very senior leader that his leadership style was screaming at people and he was actually screaming at somebody not helping the situation and uh, his values clearly came out and this very young sergeant uh, walked up to this very senior leader and he said excuse me do you mind if I talk to this gentleman because I've met him before and I have a relationship with him and the senior leader said, well, if you think you can help in a very derogatory manner. And this very young, motivated sergeant started talking to the leader of who, who we thought was the leader of the riot. And they did have a relationship. And that person brought us over to the true leader of the civil disturbance. We were able to talk to him and we were able to uh, stop the riot and nobody got hurt. So it was interesting, the difference in values and the difference in approach and difference of character uh, that that crisis brought out. I hope that goes towards your question. That's that's exactly what I was after. So thank you very much. Sure. So I'm not seeing questions. I, you did such a great job covering the topic that I think everybody is just sitting back thinking and contemplating and and looking at back at their notes. Um, so I'm gonna kind of wrap this up a little bit and first and foremost i want to thank clemson for being here that was such um, amazing insight and helpful to me as i lead a small team and work with the bigger team at the chamber so thank you so much for that and thank you for sharing center for creative leadership materials that I, I gather you uh, presented to over a thousand people earlier this week. So I'm pretty, we, we're pretty honored that you provided this to us at this stage. So thank you so much. Well, it's always an honor to be invited by Action Greensboro. Uh, what you do is very inspiring uh, for the Greensboro community. And I wanna thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I'd also like to just put a plug in for the team that uh, built all of this material. Uh, one of the participants is a guy named David Bowdenstitel. And actually David has been working with the leaders of the, of the uh, government of the state of Washington. And as you know, COVID-19 hit there first. And these leaders, lots of strain, lots of problems. They were literally solving things. Uh, they were in triage for a long time. But it was interesting as he was doing research with them and as he was going through this crisis with them, um, the leaders in Washington state uh, noted that the silver lining and the COVID-19 response was that it's brought them closer together. And it was interesting because they said it made them more human. So mm -hmm. as we think about our mindset during crisis and we look through the crisis and not at the crisis, we're actually becoming more human and building stronger relationships with those around us. So I wanna thank you again for this opportunity. I look forward to you building greater relationships as you go forward. And I can stay on until the top of the hour if anybody has any questions that might come up. All right, well, thank you, Clemson. Let me do a quick wrap up um, and a couple of reminders and updates. So I wanna mention that Leader Leadership Greensboro is an amazing program to develop and build leadership skills. They began a partnership with the Center for Creative Leadership in 2016. And CCL provides the classes of these leaders, a specialized leadership development curriculum as part of their uh, offering. You get to complete online webinar and on-site three-day intensive training with some books and resources and analysis led by their completely award-winning staff. I have had the experience of doing that and it was amazing. Um, we learned today, secondly, we learned today that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation in partnership with Vistaprint, a coalition of other companies, foundations, and philanthropic donors are providing, working to provide financial relief through the Save the Small Business Fund. This fund will provide 5,000 in short-term relief to employers across the U.S. with one-time supplemental cash grants if you've got between three and 20 employees and operate in an economically vulnerable community which is great news for those of uh, these businesses and many of them that I work with at Launch Greensboro. 
So check the site at savesmallbusiness.com to see if your business is located in one of those um, areas that they will provide this support to. And then finally, a quick reminder, if you've not completed your census, please do so at 2020census.gov. It really can make a difference for our community. And we look forward to tomorrow at three when Brett Christensen returns as our host for the Friday Forum. He's gonna have Jeff Phillips from Guilford County, as well as David Edwards from First National Bank. They're gonna provide some updates to the community on what's going on in their kind of world. So we look forward to hearing from them. So thank you all again for joining and we will see you again tomorrow.